Assalamu alaikum and um, welcome to our Muharram sessions. Uh, this is going to be episode number 11, I suppose, but we'll just call it our quick question and answer session. Uh, today, Sayyid is not going to be taking on any um, lecturing, but rather he will be focusing on answering questions that have either, either come during the sessions that we've gotten before, and uh, of course, will be open to the floor if you have any other questions that you would like to ask. Um, I have a few of my own, Sayyid, so uh, be prepared. Mine are going to be a little bit tricky, but uh, inshallah, uh, with your knowledge, I know you should be able to clear them very, very quickly. Um, to kick off, very, very um, haraka haraka, I'm going to ask a question that has come through. And uh, if you can please uh, answer this. However, I see that the brother who has asked this question is not in the group currently. So I'm not really sure. But we can, I mean, we can always watch it on YouTube. So. Uh, I guess that would, wouldn't be a problem. Um, it says, uh, Salam Sayyidna, inshallah you are well, I have a quick question. Uh, I have been trying to explain to someone uh, within my friend's circle about um, Surah number 37, um, I presume this is Surah Safat, um, verse number 130, uh, where uh, he says, uh, that Ilya Sin is the family of the Prophet. Um, I gave him all the translations and explanations as to why it is not. Uh, just now, uh, this is what I received uh, from uh, him. It says, unfortunately, that surah is not uh, in English version of Al Mizan. Can you assist me to either prove um, me wrong or them? Yeah, in this particular case, I guess it's more about clarification rather than proving anybody wrong. Uh, there's a follow-up of the same question. It says, this according to Allah Taba Tabai in Tafsir al-Mizan with the support of Hadith. Uh, even Ayatollah Nasir Makarim at the end of his Tafsir left this on the experts of Hadith to decide. Uh, so this is one of the commentaries and the other one is uh, Prophet Ilyas. So if you could please uh, tackle that. The floor is yours. Jazakumullah uh, for that uh, question. Uh, in response to this, what we would say is that the fada'il and the excellences and virtues of the Ahlul Bayt salam, are multifaceted. They are super abundant. And we don't need to, we don't need fabricated narratives that artificially superimpose and try to forcefully insert Ahlul Bayt into the Quran wherever possible in order to elevate their station or to introduce the world to their greatness. But unfortunately, the ignorant people and the sectarian minded people, uh, especially the Ghulat, they took this approach. They were very desperate to fit in the Ahlul Bayt wherever possible. Even if the verse does not allow you to fit them in, they will just try to fit them in so that they can claim one more verse in as a fadila or as part of the fadail of Ahlul Bayt al which to be honest is a completely counterproductive and unhealthy, unsound, uh, epistemologically speaking, unsound approach. You don't need to do that. Now, if you want to look at Surah Safat, let me just uh, very quickly show you exactly what's going on in this surah. Okay, so this is, I'm, I'm using the Quran with a phrase by phrase English translation uh, that's, uh, that's undertaken by Ali Quli Qarai. Okay, he's a Shia from Hyderabad. It's published by ICAS Press. If you go to page 660, you see in Surah Safat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins by talking about the Kufar and Mushrikeen of the time of the Prophet until he comes to verse 75. Here he says, وَلَقَدْ نَادَانَا نُوحٌ فَلَا نِعْمَ الْمُجِيبُونَ He starts talking about Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. I want you to observe the pattern. Look at how Allah has organized and structured this surah and you will immediately discover how what the Ghulat have tried to claim about the ayah in question 
just simply doesn't gel well with the flow and language and structure of this surah. So what Allah does here, he starts by talking about Nuh salam and his prophetic mission, how he called out to Allah, how Allah rescued him. And then at the end of this, the, the mention of Nuh, Allah does salam on him. He, he, he invokes his peace upon Nuh. He sends his peace on him. Salamun ala Nuhin fil alamin. Peace to Noah throughout the nations. Inna kadhalika najzil muhsineen. Thus indeed do we reward the virtuous. And then look at what he says. Inna hu min ibadina al-mu'mineen. He is indeed one of our faithful servants. The he is referring to whom? To Nuh alayhi salam. Very good. Then Allah comes to the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Wa inna min shi'atihi la Ibrahim. Indeed, Ibrahim was among his followers when he came to his Lord with a sound heart. Then Allah will tell you the story of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, his arguments with his people, how he tried to persuade them and convince them to abandon their shirk and come to Tawheed, this whole detailed account, and then how he was prepared to sacrifice Ismail alayhi salam. And at the end of the story, again, Allah sends salam on him, salam on ala Ibrahim, peace be to Abraham, kadhalika nadzil muhsineen, thus do we reward the virtuous. Inna hu, this who means he, okay, he is in the singular, he is indeed one of our faithful servants. Moving on, verse 114, Allah talks about two of his chosen and virtuous slaves, which are Musa and Harun. وَلَقَدْ مَنَنَّا عَلَى مُوسَى وَهَارُونَ Certainly we favored Moses and Aaron, Harun, and we delivered them and their people from the great agony. And then he tells you about what he did with them. And finally, he says, Salamun ala Musa wa Harun. Peace be to Moses and Aaron. Okay, Harun. Thus indeed do we reward the virtuous. But then here it says, Innahuma. Okay, Innahuma, not Innahu. Until now, every slave was being mentioned with Innahu because it was in the singular. Ibrahim is one person, so Innahu. He is indeed. Nuh alayhi salam is one person, so that's why innahu min ibadin al mu'mineen. Okay, he is indeed one of our faithful servants. But because here it's two people, Musa and Harun, the Quran uses the dual. After sending peace on them, it says they are indeed among our faithful servants. Now you come to the verse in question. 123, Allah says, Wa inna Ilyas al -mursaleen. Indeed, Ilyas was one of the apostles. And then Allah talks about his prophetic mission, how he tried to convince his people to abandon idol worship and to come to Tawheed. And at the end of this, you have the verse, Salamun ala Ilyasin. Salamun ala Ilyasin. Peace be to Ilyas. Now here you will see a footnote where the commentator will tell you that there are alternative pronunciations for Ilyasin. So, in accordance, yani in the Qira'a of Hafs and Asim, which is the standard uh, Qira'a, which is uh, recited uh, throughout the Muslim world nowadays, it is pronounced Ilyasin. But there is an alternate reading which reads it as Salamun ala al Yasin, which is narrated from the Qurra, such as Nafi'a. Ibn Amir, Ya'qub, Ruwais, Al-A'raj, Shayba, Imam Zayd bin Ali. Imam Zayd bin Ali doesn't have a separate qira'a. He used to favor the qira'a of Nafi'ah. So, but in any case, you can also count Imam Zayd bin Ali here. And they have given you the reference, Mu'jam Al-Qira'at Al-Qur'aniya, Volume 5, page 246. Uh, and the trans but then they say the translation will be peace be upon the progeny of Yasin. And so they say, yes, so this is where the uh, the Hulu narrative comes in. This is the claim of the 12 Imami traditional uh, people. They say that uh, Salamun ala al Yasin means peace be on the progeny of Yasin. Yasin being the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah essentially in this ayah, he's sending peace on Ali Muhammad. The al Yasin are Ali Muhammad, they are the Ahlul Bayt. But the whole structure of this passage goes against this interpretation. Why? Because observe carefully. If it was really Al Yasin, and Al Yasin here meant the progeny of the Prophet, the progeny of the Prophet according to the 12 Imami reading would be the 12 Imams, right? So they would be plural. So then how does it make sense for Allah to say, peace be to the progeny of Yasin, thus do we reward the virtuous 
he is indeed one of our faithful servants. Allah should have said, they are indeed, if the salam was upon, was upon Al Yasin, the progeny of the Prophet, the progeny of the Prophet is not one person. Rather, it is a whole group. It's 12 Imams according to the traditional 12 Imamiya reading. And according to the Zaidi reading, it is an uh, unlimited number of Imams from the progeny of the Prophet, right? So if Allah really wanted to do salam on Ali Muhammad over here, then why would he say innahu? He is indeed. The Ali Muhammad are not one person. Rather, they are multiple people. And as you can see, whenever it's more than one person, I showed you in the case of Musa and Harun, because there were two people, the Arabic of the Quran reflected and honored the fact that we are dealing with two people. So it did not say innahu. It said innahuma. It used the dual. They are indeed among our faithful servants because they is referring to the people on whom the salam is being done and there are two. So in the same way, if the salam here was not on Ilyas, rather it was on the progeny of the Prophet, the progeny of the Prophet, then it would be innahum min ibadin al mu'minin. Indeed, they were among our faithful slaves. That's point number one. Linguistically, it does not make sense to, to, uh, to plug in Ali Muhammad over here. That's number one. Number two, does it make sense to you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's following a set for, you see, this is a set format. There's a whole pattern here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, starting from Nuh, he mentions the story of Nuh. As I told you at the beginning, he mentions the story of Nuh, his prophetic mission. And then he sends peace on Nuh. He mentions Ibrahim and then he sends the peace at the end of the story. He sends peace on Ibrahim. Uh, he mentions the story of Musa and Harun and peace be on Musa and Harun. But all of a sudden he will mention the story of Ilyas. And at the end of his story, all of a sudden peace be upon the progeny of Muhammad. Peace be on the progeny of Yasin. Does that make sense to you? Does that fit here? I mean, this is nonsensical to claim that in a, in, in a passage that's talking about Ilyas and his prophetic mission and how he tried to bring people to Tawheed. And at the end, Allah says, peace be upon Ilyasin. Thus do we reward the virtuous. He is indeed one of our faithful slaves. And you say, no, no, no. But because according to one pronunciation, you can read it as Ali Yasin. Therefore, it must be the progeny of the Prophet. The correct explanation is that we do not deny that in one of the Qira'at, one in one dialect or in one variation of the reading, you can read it as Ali Yasin. OK, we are not against this reading because it is Mutawatir, but we are against the translation. What we would say is that Ali Yasin is another way of pronouncing Il Yasin. It's just like Ibrahim. People don't know this. Mostly people don't know this. But those who are experts of Qira'at would know that Ilm al Qira'ah is the science of reciting and the different dialects and recitations of the Quran. They would know that even the name Ibrahim is pronounced as Ibrahim in our uh, mainstream popular reading, which is the reading of Hassan Asin. In other readings, in other dialects which were approved by the Prophet, the name Ibrahim is pronounced as Ibrahim. Similarly, we read it as Zakariya. But in other readings, it is Zakariya, right? So the name, uh, the names of prophets, uh, the Arabs had different dialects. Some would pronounce it as Ibrahim. Some would pronounce it as Ibrahim or Abraham. But the important thing is that they are referring to the same person. Whether you say Ilyasin or Aliyasin, it's referring to Ilyas alayhi salam. It cannot refer to anyone else. The language of the Quran and the context of the surah and the passage does not allow you to plug in anyone into this passage other than Prophet Ilyas alayhi salam. So this is why we need to decry and we condemn this phenomenon that's found, unfortunately, in sectarian sources. Look, we ourselves are very huge and big believers in the fadail of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. But we believe that their true fadail should be mentioned. The true way to honor the Ahlul Bayt salam is not to plug them artificially and force them into passages where they don't fit. You will make yourself and them the laughing stock of the Ummah if you follow such an approach. Rather, you fit them. There is no shortage of Sahih and authentic and mutawatir reports that talk about the Fadail of Ahlul Bayt. Present those uh, reports. Don't do violence with the Quranic text. Don't distort and disfigure and uh, reverse engineer and retrofit readings into the Quranic text or interpretations and wrong translations into the Quranic text 
just to forcefully insert Ahlul Bayt into a place where they obviously do not belong. I apologize for ranting and raving, but this is something that I uh, personally believe in very strongly. I, this is very annoying when we see sectarian people trying to plug in and fit in imams of Ahlul Bayt uh, where they don't belong. It reeks of desperation and it does not strengthen the case of the school of Ahlul Bayt. That was very well tackled because, I mean, the way it is in, in the format that it has come, it automatically shows you that there is, a, there is a method to it. And if you read it, if you understand it, I mean, I'm not an expert in Arabic, but of course, if you look at it, any, any person logically would be able to make uh, sense out of it. Um, <clears throat> so there are, following on that, um, there's another, there's a hand that has been raised and there's a question that uh, needs to be asked. I will let uh, Brother Ali uh, unmute his mic and ask his question and then we'll go to questions that I have that have been written. Brother Ali, Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Doctor, for this uh, insightful answer. Uh, my, my question is related to the question which uh, has been asked by the brother Samir. Uh, just uh, upon the, uh, as you said, the fitting of Al al uh, in the Quran, Quranic context, I'm, uh, I want to uh, ask your opinion about uh, the Ayah Mubahila. Uh, in which uh, uh, we 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 uh, the Shia says that uh, you know you know the concept of ayat al mubahila and uh, also the hadith al kisa which is a very famous hadith um, about the Pantan Park and the stuff and also the third one is uh, the the giving of zakat uh, while in ruku which uh, is considered to be uh, the ayah in the recognition of Imam Ali alayhi salam. So, uh, uh, Sayyid, can you kindly uh, explain that uh, whether these three uh, these three narrations uh, can be fit can be fit uh, for the for the Imam Al Al Bayt and okay, thank you. Okay, so. Um, with regard to ayat al mubahala uh, that can be accepted right? because there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said faqul ta'ala nad'u abna'ana wa abna'akum wa nisa'ana wa nisa'akum wa anfusana wa anfusakum thumma nabtahil fa naj'al la'nat Allahi 'ala al-kadhibin so there the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam is instructed to say that you bring your women if they from an hajja kafihi min ba'di ma ja'aka min al-'ilm whoever disputes with you or tries to argue with you after certain knowledge of this matter, that is the uh, prophetology of Isa alayhi salam, that was the matter that was being debated between the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the Christians of Najran. So if after this, uh, after the clear certain knowledge has come to you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they still dispute with you, then challenge them and say, you bring your women, we bring our women, you bring your sons, we bring our sons, we bring ourselves, you bring yourselves. So here, there is no doubt that the Ahlul Bayt are the family of the Prophet. The Holy Prophet وسلم, in both Shia and Sunni sources is reported to have referred to Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein السلام, as his sons because they were his grandchildren through Sayyidah Fatima. السلام, so here there is no question of artificial or forceful insertion. The very verse of the Quran is saying our women, your women. So if the Holy Prophet وسلم, is not going to take Sayyidah Fatima عليها, as part of his women folk, then who else is he going to take, right? If he's not going to take Al-Hasan and Al-Husayn as uh, representatives of his children, who else is he going to take? The Holy Prophet had no surviving children other than uh, them at that point, together with Sayyidah Fatima So here there is no need for any retrofitting. There is no need for any artificial in insertion. And this is why uh, no one disputes this, really, in the Ummah. No sincere, learned person will dispute that Ayatul Mubahala is definitely a vote of confidence uh, in favor of the Ahlul Bayt al Muslim. It is mentioned as part of their Fadail and their Manaqib. Uh, with regard to the other verse that you mentioned... Uh, uh, hadith al-Kisa. Hadith al-Kisa. So, Hadith al-Kisa 
there is a long version that's recited. We have an Isnad episode with our respected moderator. I think you were there with us for that. Uh, we have a detailed discussion. It's an Isnad episode. Uh, inshallah, I hope the admins will link you to it after this session. You can watch that. And we have presented the research of Ayatollah Sheikh Muhammad al Rai Shahri, who has explained that there are two versions of Hadith al Kisa. One is the longer version that is generally recited traditionally at our gatherings. Uh, that one, especially the second part of it, is not authentic and also it does not gel well with the Quran. But the core story that there was this incident, this incident happened, the Holy Prophet وسلم, took the Ahlul Bayt under his uh, umbrella, metaphorically speaking, under his cloak, and he declared them to be his special Ahlul Bayt. This part is not uh, really disputed. Evidence of his is there in both Shia and Sunni sources. Both of them accepted, and that's why the five uh, Panjatan are ex accepted as Ahlul Kisa and Ashabul Kisa. So that also the core story is not problematic. But later on, this core story was embellished, and more was added to it. Right. So that part, even tradition, learned traditional twelve or Imami scholars like Ash Sheikh Muhammad Ar Shahri they are dismissive of it and they do not authenticate it uh, coming to the third uh, point that you mentioned verse surah 5 verse 55 and yes. connecting it with the incident of giving zakat while in ruku so aslan if you look at that passage and i think we explained this in one of the big fifth lectures also uh, if you look at the passage if you begin from where the passage begins from surah 50 you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing the believers not to take the Jews and Christians, the hostile Jews and Christians, as allies. They're not supposed to form political alliances with them. So the whole passage, it revolves around this topic. That there is a group of Muslims who are weak in faith in Medina, and they are forming alliances with the Ahlul Kitab, with hostile Jews and Christians. Some of them were even sharing intelligence with them. Now, why were they forging alliances with them? Because Muslims in Medina were in a very precarious situation. They were always under the threat of attack. They feared that any time the Kuffar and Mushrikeen of Makkah can mobilize an alliance the way they did during the Battle of Ahzab, and they can attack us and annihilate us. So we need to have alliances. We need to have we need to network and, and form these relationships with these powerful tribes so that we can turn to them in our time of need. And so some of these Muslims started forming these alliances with Jews and Christians. And in it, of course, the Jew, there has to be a quid pro quo. The Jews and Christians are not going to defend you for free. You have to sell them intelligence. You have to betray your trust. Yeah, and you have to betray the Prophet. And so Allah revealed this whole passage to forbid the Muslims from doing this. In verse 50, he revealed the verse, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, verse 51, sorry, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, la tattakhidu al-yahuda wa nasara awliya, ba'duhum awliya u ba'd, all you who believe, do not take the Jews and Christians as awliya. So it's talking about wilaya here, but it's the wilaya in the sense of military and political alliance. And then in the next verse, Allah goes on to condemn those who are forging alliances with them. And then after that, he says, well, if you people are going to turn away from my guidance and I'm going to replace you. I'm going to bring a new community of people who are going to be very uh, loving towards the believers, very firm against the unbelievers. So the whole passage is about establishing this concept that your political and military alliance is supposed to be with the prophet and with the community of the believers. And that's in, in this context, then verse 55 comes and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ مَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ وَهُمْ رَاكِعُونَ That indeed, only, your only true ally and protector and guardian is Allah and His Messenger and those who believe. So Allah, to, again, He's talking about the plural. If he wanted to talk about one person, he would mention that one person. Allah does not shy away from the truth, right? In Allah la yastahi, wallahu la yastahi min al haq. Allah does not shy away from the haq. So if it was one person that he had in mind specifically, then the verse of the Quran, its grammar, its structure would reflect that. But here Allah is, is he does not want you to have alliance only with him and with the Prophet and with one person from the community of Medina. No. 
He wants your alliance to be with the entire community of practicing believers in Medina who, who establish the prayer and give the zakah and they are humble. So this verse is about the community of Medina and uh, that was living under the Prophet, that was under his leadership. Allah was telling these weak uh, in faith Muslims that your true allies are Allah, the Prophet and the community of the believers. And that's why he concludes again the next verse 56 by saying, وَمَن يَتَوَلَّ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فَإِنَّ حِزْبَ اللَّهِ هُمُ الْغَالِبُونَ Allah says, whosoever aligns himself with Allah and the Messenger, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا and those who have believed. So you can see the, the whole passage, if you read it, after removing your sectarian blinkers and after removing all bias and keeping in mind the ground realities of Medina and what was actually happening on the ground as it's preserved in the books of the Sirah, you will see that the verse and this whole passage is a very clear message. Allah wants you to break your alliances with all entities that are hostile to Islam. And Allah is saying that, look, if you are worried that you will be attacked, who will you turn to? I am there. The messenger is there. The community of believers are there. Did we not protect the city state of Medina in the Battle of Badr when they had come to eliminate you? Did we not protect the city state of Medina in Uhud? Did we not ward off the might of the allies when they came in Ahzab? So Allah is saying, I have proved myself and my mess I and my messenger and the community of believers who are under my guidance. We have successfully defended the city of Medina. You do not need to forge alliances with hostile parties. You can your only alliance should be with us and we will protect you. Thank you, sir, for this answer. That's a very interesting outlook to 555. Um, okay, so we have three hands and I have about five questions. So if you can keep no, four hands and several questions. So if you can keep your, uh, your answers a little bit quick and short, that would be amazing. All right, so we'll ask, uh, we'll start with uh, Rahish Hassan. Uh, you can unmute and ask your question. Yeah, uh, Assalamu alaikum, sir. Assalamu alaikum, Sayyidina. Uh, sir, my question is uh, regarding the martyrdom of uh, the two children of uh, Hazrat Muslim bin Aqil. It is being often uh, recited, not on a specified date, but generally on uh, during the early uh, days of the first Ashura, that they were martyred uh, somewhere near Kufa or at a place because we also have their ziyara. So, is that story? Uh, true, authentic, or is it a fabrication, or does it have any basis? Right. So this this is a, a popular narrative, and indeed, yes, in many of the communities, there are actually dates on which uh, the, the shahadat of the Tiflani Muslim, the two children of Muslim, uh, is uh, commemorated. So the earliest and strongest historical accounts uh, tell us of the of the Al Aqil and the family of Aqil and their sacrifices at Karbala. Now, were there two uh, smaller, uh, younger children of Muslim السلام, who were taken and martyred in this manner? This is not something we have uh, very strong evidence for, and uh, it's not well documented in in uh, the with the strongest chains as we would like it to be. So this is why. There is uh, grounds for some skepticism here. Um, we do have clear accounts of the Ali Aqil and other relatives of Muslim in Aqil being present in Karbala, them defending Imam Hussein alayhi salam. But this incident uh, is not really uh, mentioned in authoritative sources that talk about Muslims' journey. And it's also questionable why he would take with him uh, such little children, especially when he left his wife behind he left his family behind. It was a hazardous, hazardous mission. So uh, it's most likely that he went there all by himself. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to make a historical case for the martyrdom of these two children. Thank you. Thank you for your question, right? Um, Hasnain Haider, uh, you can unmute and ask your question.
السلام علیکم ڈاکٹر ہاؤ ار یو ریفیوٹ One was that he was the most deserving person, and he was the most deserving candidate for being elected. This argument we could uh, pro- uh, propagate, and there, was, there is another argument that he has a divine power. Right? These two options we as a Shia had at our disposal. Instead of propagating or selling the point selling that option that he was the most deserving we went we took we channelized through we refuted we started refuting through divine power that he is the divine candidate so he should be elected and this has caused rift this has brought nothing and it it has created gap also and it gave at the same time it gave slow poison to our community right that we in indul- we are indulging in shirk this this is this happened to our community and our other sunni brothers they also started saying that it is useless concept and they, they we could not sell the idea of proper selection of imam ali alayhi salam right so this has all gone into vain and if we stick now it is a time that we should start Uh, selling this idea that he was the most deserving candidate because of his uh, efforts and because of his sacrifices and proximity to a, a, a prophet that's why he should have been selected and we base this in which we, we still have time now we should start propagating this idea and we should come out from this shirk issue this is one thing second thing do- doctor i have one small question that Uh, the after the karbala after karbala the events were very fresh for imam uh, zainul abidin alaihi salam imam baqar alaihi salam imam jafar sadiq alaihi salam it was very fresh because these are immediate successors right so they, their format of commemoration of karbal morning karbala would have been little different than the commemoration made done by the latter imams because it was now far away right after 100 years and so what was the format of latter imams of morning karbala if they were also listening the st- each story and they were preferring to uh, Uh, is, is, is listen uh, the details of the battle then it is difficult to stop our community that don't go into the detail right if if they didn't prefer if they just like ibrahim alayhi salam we just say he sacrifice how he put this knife and how blood was coming out if we go into detail then we are creating we, we people will go to many any level to start this morning and weeping so i can, i think you put you understood my question we we should not go into detail if other later imams didn't go into detail okay doctor thank you very much god bless you thank you salam thank alaykum. you um Actually, there is a question that is um, um, along the very similar lines. Um, if you don't mind me just putting it through, because I think it, it can. It says, uh, Salams, thank you uh, very much for your time and to the organizers of the facilitating the sessions for us. We've benefited, alhamdulillah. The question says, in one of your lectures, you noted that Imam Hussein does not need our tears, but he needs us to follow in his steps to uphold Quran and Sunnah. However, Uh, wouldn't it be the case that Imam Hussein really doesn't need anything from us? He would be happy on the Day of Judgment to know we strive to follow his footsteps. 
but he doesn't need anything from us it is rather us that we need to uphold quran and sunnah for ourselves for our own salvation okay so yeah this is uh, along the same lines so first of all let me start by commenting on uh, the first point that was raised by our respected uh, elder al haj uh, hasanain sahab uh, it's a very good point he talked about the two models that we have within shiism the first model is actually what the ahlul bayt alayhim historically speaking all the available evidence that we have points to the fact that the ahlul bayt alayhim believed in this model which is the model that says that imam ali alayhi salam should have succeeded the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as leader of the muslim ummah both politically and spiritually because of his merits because of his qualifications because of his long and rich track record of service to islam and because of it of his being part of the family of the prophet you see uh, in the past in arabia and in other societies they had this custom that after a a great person whether he be a great political leader a king uh, a tribal head or chief after he goes away people would turn to his family and if there was a viable candidate with, within the family uh, he would be the one who would be chosen and in fact this is a format that was also followed by god by the way that when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to choose a prophet after daud alayhi salam who did he choose sulaiman alayhi salam his son when he wanted to choose a prophet after is ibrahim alayhi salam who did he choose his sons ismail alayhi salam ishaq alayhi salam so basically succession in the past was always kept within the family and people used to turn to the family and look at the family to provide successors now in the case of imam ali alayhi salam after the prophet because allah did not reveal anything about this in the quran and the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also did not bind he did not forcefully push someone on the ummah and say look i am leaving you with no choice you have to whether you like or you don't you have to accept what i'm thrusting on you because the prophet did not follow this approach the ahlul bayt alayhi wasallam the approach that they took was imam ali alayhi salam himself imam hasan imam hussein alayhi salam imam zaida alayhi salam these imams said that look okay we're not claiming that allah or the prophet have made it wajib on you to accept us as your imams we're not going to claim that because that would be lying against allah and the prophet but still if you go by cultural norms if you go by traditional norms the way it was customary um so long as there is a viable candidate from the prophet's family who is qualified who is politically intelligent who is militarily capable you know he has all the qualities of leadership in him why should you choose someone who is distant and far away from the family of the prophet when you have someone within the family of the prophet who has all the qualifications so this was the early model uh, that the imams of ahlul bayt themselves subscribed to this is what the early shia used to believe in and this is also the kind of model that we try to align ourselves because it's the historically strong model later on what happened was that even though most of the early shia they believed in this model later on when they started having arguments and polemics okay with people from other sects other political parties these arguments when they got messy and they got heated what used to happen was that you have then you then have extremism on both sides so you see it's just like it starts as a friendly argument for example me and brother samir may have an argument as to which team is best uh, qualified to be let's say the to be declared the dream team and i might say it's manchester united and he will say it's liverpool and we can argue about this and it's okay he's entitled to his opinion i to mine but then when things get heated you know especially since he's a religious person and i'm also a religious person sometimes the temptation is there shaitan comes in and i start and he convinces us to bring religion into this and to start saying no 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 it's not only that manchester united is the best team but rather allah has declared it the best team and so if you don't accept it you are kafir i will excommunicate you from the fold of islam and I, so this is basically what happened with sectarianism is that muslims they fought with each other and it was okay to to have disputes but then they gave a religious flavor to their disputes and this is how the positions hardened and this is how all the sectarianism came about so i totally agree with the al haj hasanain sahab's point that we should be promoting the historically accurate model which is the model that argues for the succession of imam ali alayhi salam based on his 
overwhelming and super abundant merits and fada'il, which no one in the ummah can deny or dispute. The second question that he asked was, as a dari after Imam Hussain alayhi salam, we had these imams of Ahlul Bayt, how did they honor the remembrance of Imam Hussain alayhi salam? We gave a whole lecture, if you recall, in this series, uh, in which we explained how the Zaidi imams continued uh, the mission of Imam Hussain alayhi salam through revolutions, through rising up against the tyrant oppressors of their time, exactly the way Imam Hussain alayhi salam did so. And the quietest Imams from the Twelver line, they also continued the legacy of Imam Hussain alayhi salam by promoting and preaching the Quran and Sunnah, disseminating knowledge of the authentic Sharia and authentic Sunnah to their students. So they also honored and revived the Quran and Sunnah and they kept it alive in the in their circles with regard to the third question where about the statement that imam hussein alayhi salam does not need our tears and sympathy he needs us to commit ourselves to his mission uh the the the, the comment of the brother being that imam hussein alayhi salam is now with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has achieved the ultimate fawzan azima the ultimate success so now he is not in need of anything well of course we don't mean we don't mean to say that imam hussein alayhi salam is needy in the sense that he will derive some kind of personal benefit if we uh, commit ourselves to reviving the Quran and Sunnah. No, rather what we mean when we say that Imam Hussain alayhi salam, if he were to come today or if he were with us today, what he would need from us, as in what he would require from us, what he would want from us is for us to stand up for the Quran and Sunnah and to uh, pro promote the religion that his grandfather, beloved grandfather, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, uh, spilled so much sweat and his own blood to, to defend it. So Imam Hussain salam obviously has achieved Fawzan Azimah, but because he was an Imam, he was a leader, okay, he had a vision for his people and he outlined that vision and that vision was revival of the Quran and Sunnah. So if we claim that we are followers of Imam Hussain salam, then the vision of Imam Hussain applies to us. We cannot uh, run away from that vision. And yes, there is no doubt, I agree with the brother, that when we fulfill Imam Hussain's vision in our life, in the Ummah today, Imam Hussain is not going to derive any benefit from it, of course. Neither is Rasulullah, nor is Allah. Rather, we are the ones who are going to profit and benefit. And that's exactly what Imam Hussain alayhi salam, says. He says, if you obey me, tas'adu, you will attain prosperity and success. So his mission and his vision ultimately was for our benefit. Just as the mission of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the deen that he brought us is for our benefit. Thank you for that, Sayyid. Um, <clears throat> I have a very um, close question to that, but I'm going to leave it because that's my personal question. <clears throat> I will let uh, Muhammad uh, Kaim Hussain ask his question. Muhammad, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Assalamu alaikum. My question is actually related to what was being discussed here uh, a minute ago. Someone asked about the verse of Mubahala. And you agreed that no doubt the the, the Ahl al Kisa are uh, the misdaq of this verse that Abna ana wa Abna akum al Hassan and al Hussein were taken and Nisa ana wa Nisa akum Sayyidah Fatima was taken. But where does Imam Ali come into this? Because the Imamis argue that Imam Ali comes under the the uh, the word Anfusana, we ourselves and yourselves, and the argument they they take it too literally and they say, well, since Imam Ali is included in Anfusana, so that makes him the nafs of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa ali. and but using this. Using this, they try to argue that Imam Ali salam, is above all the other prophets, no matter who it is, whether it is Ibrahim salam, or Nuh salam, who, no matter who it is, he's above because he's the nafs of the prophet and he shares all his characteristics except uh, Nubuwa and Risala. And uh, then they tie it with the hadith of Manzila. That you are to me what ha uh, what Harun was to Musa. So they try to make a make a case for Imam Ali's uh, closeness to the Prophet and his likeness to the Prophet, and therefore they raise him above all the other prophets. So how do we interpret Anfusana or 
as some Sunnis have tried to argue that Imam Ali salam comes under Abna Ana because he was the son-in-law of the Prophet and he was brought up under the care of the Prophet. The first question is this. Then another one is still related to what's being discussed here is about the divine appointment of Imam Ali salam and a Shia brother who was debating Muhammad Hijab made this argument that it has been the Sunnah of Allah to appoint himself the caliphs on earth we know from adam and Dawood and even worldly uh, or what would you say uh, like malik and hukama uh, allah has appointed for like in allah qad ba'atha lakum qaluta malika so how come after the prophet sallallahu alaihi was sallallahu alaihi wasallam there was no such divine selection of the successor and by divine selection, the brother doesn't mean here that that same concept of imama that twelvers have, but rather that successor was divinely appointed and it was political khilafa. So please answer me on these two points. Thank you. Okay. So with regard to Anfusana, the, in the verse of Mubahala, uh, it's very problematic to try and fit Imam Ali alayhi salam under Abna'ana, under the sons of the, uh, uh, the, the Prophet by virtue of him being the son-in-law. Uh, it's much uh, more, and if you go by the rules of Arabic, it is Imam Ali Islam fits in much more smoothly in Anfusana. Because the whole point, why is Allah using plural for Anfusana? If the Holy Prophet is the only one who is being referred to as ourself, then it would just be nafsi. The Prophet could say, uh, nad'u abna'ana wa abna'akum wa nisa'ana wa nisa'akum wa nafsi wa anfusakum. You know, I bring myself and you bring yourselves up. But him saying Anfusana refers to ourselves, meaning I'm going to bring my people, okay? People who come under the category of, of ourselves. So if you look at the Arabic of the Quran, I would uh, like to refer you to verse 61 of Surah to nur okay? Surah uh, 24 of the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing the believers and he says, فَإِذَا دَخَلْتُمْ At the end of the verse, he says, فَإِذَا دَخَلْتُمْ بُيُوتًا فَسَلِّمُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِكُمْ تَحِيَّةً مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ مُبَارَكَةً طَيِّبًا Allah says when you enter houses, okay, especially even your own house, this is the teaching of Allah and the sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, that when you enter any house, including your own house, سَلِّمُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِكُمْ Do salam on, Allah says, أَنفُسَكُمْ أو أَنفُسِكُمْ Do salam on yourselves. Now, what does this mean and how has the Ummah understood this verse? Sallimu ala anfusikum. Does anyone upon entering the house say, As-salamu alayya, may the peace of Allah be upon me? No. <laughs> it's always, even when the Prophet used to enter any house, including his own Ahlul Bayt, he used to say, As-salamu alaykum, ya Ahlul Bayt. And this would be, this comes under this command of Allah. So what does that show you? That shows you that Anfusana in Arabic refers to whosoever you consider as your own people. So when I'm entering the house and I see, let's say I have two sons of mine. These two sons of mine, they are from me, right? They are my people. They are my family. So they come under Anfusana. If let's say my son-in-law is there in the house, he's also one of me, right? He's married to my daughter. So he's also one of me. Whosoever is inside my house, who I consider to be a part of me, a part of my family, he is Anfusana. And that's what the verses of the Quran is saying, that when you enter the house, greet yourselves, meaning greet your people, right? Because when you enter the house, you will find your people there. So I hope that linguistic point is clear. So Imam Ali al -Islam, it, much more smoothly, he fits under Anfusana. He doesn't have to, uh, people will say, uh, they sometimes confuse this for thinking Anfusana means he is Nafsir Rasul in the sense that he and the Prophet are not, not two separate entities. No, no, no. The Prophet is Rasul. He has Risala. Imam Ali al -Islam does not have Risala. They are two separate entities, but they are one family. In the eyes of Allah and in the eyes of the Prophet, they are one family. Okay. So when the Prophet says Anfusana, that is inclusive of whomsoever he considers part of himself and his immediate family. With regard to the other points that you mentioned about uh, the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I think if you look at our review of the arguments of uh, say the Ammar that were recently done, I think we responded to that. We said there is no denying the fact that in the past Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used to appoint 
But then whenever Allah appoints, the evidence for that is always sudura. Like you mentioned, Allah appointed Talut, right? So look at the verse of the Quran. There is no other way you can interpret it. And no one in the Ummah disputes it. Because it is قَطْعَيُّ دَلَالَ قَطْعَيُّ صُدُورِ يعني It gives you absolute certainty about the appointment of Talut. Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ On the tongue of the Prophet, He says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ بَعَثَ لَكُمْ طَالُوتَ مَلِكَ Allah has raised Talut as your king. The question is, do you have such a clear verse carrying such a clear appointment for Imam Ali Islam in the Quran? Or if you move outside the Quran, in the Sunnah, in the Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, do you have any nas or any text that is both Qat'iyyu Dalala and Qat'iyyu Sudur? And the answer of the 12 or Imami traditional Shia scholarship is no, there is no. The texts which are Qat'iyyu Dalala, they are Zanniyu Sudur. Yani, when the meaning is definitive, the transmission is non-definitive. The transmission is Zanni, as in it's single chain. So you don't get certainty that the Prophet would have really said this. Because certainty you get when something is mass transmitted. Right? A single chain anyone can invent. Right? Yeah. So anything that's transmitted by a single chain can only be zanni in terms of sudur, in terms of emanation. So the texts which are extremely clear, they are zanni sudur. And the texts which are qat'ayu sudur, yani which are mass transmitted, like hadithul ghadir, hadithul manzila, hadithul thaqalain, they are zanni dalala, as in their their meaning is not definitive. Yani you cannot say that these are legal appointments. And even the Ahlul Bayt Ali Muslim historically never used Hadith al Manzila or Hadith al Ghadir or Hadith al Thaqalain to claim that we are divinely appointed. Rather, they always understood these to be recommendations in their favor, which bolster their position. With, and, but they never claimed that these are legal appointments. I think there has been a big confusion between a legal appointment and a recommendation or a nomination okay so it's just like a, a professor of mine you know in universities you would all be familiar with this that a professor would i have several testimonials for me that have been written by very learned professors from my university in which they praise my qualifications they praise my command and my expertise on my subject I cannot take these testimonials and show up one day in Harvard or Oxford and say, look, these are experts in Arabic and Islamic studies. They have given me these ijazas. And so where is my classroom? I want to start teaching from tomorrow. I said, Baba, no, no, no. You can have all the recommendations in the world in your favor. But there is a process. There is a procedure. The procedure is we, we're going to have an interview. First of all, we should advertise a post. And then there should be an interview. We will grill you. We will examine you. And we will put you through a panel. And then once you pass all those stages, then you get to be a professor at our university. In the same way, Imam Ali al Islam has a lot of these uh, fada'il hadith in his favor, which if the ummah were to fairly and sincerely uh, consider, uh, they should have looked at all these ahadith and said, well, if someone is so highly praised by the Prophet, Maybe we don't need to look beyond him, especially since he's from the family of the Prophet. He has been personally trained and groomed by the Prophet. So who better than him? But the procedure, as Imam Ali Islam himself describes in Najul Balagha, was not that Allah appoints and he becomes Talifa and everyone comes and gives him bayan. No. After the Prophet, it is up to the Muhajirin and Ansar, who are the main stakeholders in Medina. They have to decide who they want to choose. Now, all these prophetic recommendations should have been, if there was a proper shura, these recommendations would be presented. The Banu Hashim would present it. Imam Ali would present it. And then in light of that presentation, the Muhajirin and Ansar would be like, yeah, man, there is no one who has such recommendations, you know, from the Prophet like Imam Ali. So maybe we should choose him. And then they would choose him. And then Imam Ali al -Islam would become the Khalifa. But unfortunately, that did not happen because things were done in a haste. The Ansar wanted to grab power. And this is another lecture in itself to explain to you why the Ansar, Ansar are so highly praised in the Quran. If you read the verses of the Quran and the authentic ahadith of the Prophet, the Ansar are some of the most beloved slaves of Allah. Then why did they, what happened to them? <laughs> they were trying to grab power. Molana, you need lecture for this to explain to you what exactly was going on. I know this is a question answer session. Our moderator has been very patient, but I don't want to test his patience. Uh, but yeah, these are all things that require detailed explanations as to exactly what was going on in the ground and why things happened the way that they happen inshallah i hope in the future we can have some detailed sessions on this to explain to you all of these things it's very interesting 
Thank you so much for that. Uh, Mohammed, I know you've raised your hand again, but I will, uh, I'm going to sideline you because there are so many other questions that need to be answered. So um, apologies for this. Said Ali um, Abbas uh, Bilgrami, you can unmute and ask, and then I will come to Isa Campos. You will be the next person after this. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Sayyid. Thank you so much for everything. Uh, the lectures have been really very informative. Uh, so this uh, question was with regards to the daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So as as slowly, I mean, uh, as the awareness is growing, we are coming to know that Maulah Ali had sons by the name of uh, Hazrat Abu Bakr. I mean, not on the name of Hazrat Abu Bakr, but they had Abu Bakr, Umar, and Usman, who were also martyred at Karbala. So with regards to the, the daughters of uh, uh, Rasulullah, uh, I mean. The Shias have been in constant denial that there is only one daughter and apparently the other daughters, if they were, they were, I mean, some relatives of Bibi Khatija and they were not daughters of uh, Rasulullah. So I wanted a clarification of that, but uh, as per my research, little bit that I've done, I, I mean, uh, there was a daughter, uh, Zainab, who had uh, a daughter, Umam. Uh, about whom I think Bibi Fatima had given a wasiyat on her deathbed to Maula Ali to marry her after she passes away. Uh, that was one thing. And also when I was reading a salwat in Mafati ul uh, there is uh, a salwat on the daughters specifically mentioned, Zainab binte Muhammad and Umme, Sa Umme Kulsum binte Muhammad. So I don't think you can have binte Muhammad if they were adopted daughters as such. So I mean, uh, so I needed some clarification on that. And what 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 is the reason? I mean, uh, what, what, uh, so because uh, they were married to Hazrat Usman, or I, I don't know what, what's the reason why have she has been in denial because it doesn't uh, decrease the merits of Bibi Fatima because she she has has altogether another fazilat amongst the other daughters if they were. Right. So as far as the question of the number of the Prophet's daughters is concerned, if you ask a truly learned Muhaqqib from among the traditional 12-er Imamiyya, he will admit that the 12-er Imami sources with authentic narrations confirm from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt that the Holy Prophet wasallam had four daughters and they were indeed his biological daughters. But, uh, and in fact in the Quran also this is confirmed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in that verse of Surah Al-Ahzab, Surah 33 verse 59 when he talks about the hijab, right? He says, Ya ayyuhan nabiyu kulli azwajika wa banatika wa nisa'il mu'minina yudnina alayhinna min jalabibihin. Right? So he says, tell your wives and tell your daughters. Um, whereas if he had only one daughter, it would be kulli azwajika wa bintika wa nisa'il mu'minin. Now if they say, no, 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 the daughters as in metaphorically, you know, all the women of the ummah are daughters of the Prophet in a way. Then the answer is, then why would Allah say, the, the women of the Ummah have already been covered in the in the third uh, clause, right? The women folk of the believing men. So the verse mentions three categories. Yeah, Tell your wives, tell your daughters, and tell the believing women or the wives of the believers. So the women of the Ummah have already been covered. So why would Allah need to refer to them twice? Once as daughters and one as... So basically... The clear meaning of this verse is that, yes, the Holy Prophet had multiple daughters, not only Sayyidah Fatima sallallahu alayha, even though Sayyidah Fatima sallallahu alayha is the most illustrious. She is the only one who survived the Holy Prophet. Her fabail and her virtues are on the next level. Uh, and you are very right. I fully agree with you that accepting that the Holy Prophet had other daughters does not reduce her maqam, just as accepting Imam Hassan alayhi salam, as the grandson of the Prophet, does it reduce the maqam of uh, Imam Hussain alayhi salam? In fact, accepting Imam Hassan and Imam Hussain as the masters of the youth of paradise does not reduce the maqam of Imam Ali alayhi salam because the narration says, Wa abuhuma khayrun minhuma. Their father is superior to them. So, uh, this is just basically, I would say, well, so you, his question is, why do they not accept it? Ignorance, ignorance of the sources. If you go to the 12-er imami sources, they're very clear that the Holy Prophet did have four daughters. And yes, two of them were married to Uthman ibn Affan. 
Um, yeah, this is all history that cannot be denied. And yes, Sayyidah Fatima is, uh, is the virtuous daughter of the Prophet as well. Her fadail are, you know, they're, they're there. Nothing can detract from her fadail and her great position. But yeah, I would say that uh, it's reducible to ignorance of the 12 er imami corpus and the authentic narrations in it. Thank you so much for that, uh, Said. Um, Isa, you have the floor. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Um, I have a question pertaining to Al Aqsa Mosque. Um, some traditional Shia argue that we shouldn't be involved with Al Aqsa. Um, as most of us know, every day there's Muslims being physically and verbally assaulted at Al Aqsa. <laughs> and, um, then you have Ayatollah Khamenei and Sunni allies actively involved in trying to um, free Al-Aqsa from any violations. Um, what is the correct approach? The correct approach is that the Holy Prophet وسلم, gave us the vision of a united brotherhood and Muslim Ummah. And he also said that the Muslim Ummah is like one body. Whenever any single part of the body is suffering from any kind of pain or discomfort the entire body suffers and experiences pain and this is how we as muslims should be that at, in any part of the world regardless of geographical location wherever our believing brothers and sisters are being targeted wherever they are being persecuted wherever they are being tortured and oppressed and being deprived of their rights uh, we should definitely stand up for them we should lobby the international community. We should do whatever is in our power to resist and oppose and expose the oppressors. However much we can do within our circumstances. So yeah, that is the vision that the Holy Prophet wasallam gave us. Uh, the Muslims in Al-Aqsa are our brothers and our sisters. And this is indeed why um, the majority of the 12 -er Imami scholars and as well as the Zaidi scholarship also and the Sunni scholarship, I think this is one of the areas where we have one of the rare areas where there is real unity in the Ummah, is that the whole Ummah is united against the oppressors, against the occupiers, and it supports the cause of those who are dispossessed and disenfranchised and living under an apartheid in their own land. And uh, our du'as and our prayers and our support uh, should be with them. Um, and what about the status of Al-Aqsa itself? Because um, I've heard some argue that it's not actually a holy site. Others argue it is, and, and this differs between Sunni and Shia across the board. Um, no, it is definitely the third holiest site uh, in Islam. Uh, it is where the Prophet wasallam is believed to have uh, 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 stopped as a transit stop on, on the journey of Isra and Mi'raj. And it is a place that is associated with prophets of the Banu Israel, whom even we as Muslims have faith in. And we believe in their prophethood. We believe in the scriptures and revelations that came to them from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is a sacred space for us as Muslims as well. Um, thank you for that, uh, Brother Isa. Um, I would like to just uh, bring you guys back to Muharram. Um, I would appreciate if the questions were towards the, the sessions that we had and questions about Muharram. So if you have a question that is not related to Muharram, uh, maybe you can ask it and then maybe it can be answered and we'll put it up on our, um, on, on our YouTube. Um, for this particular case, I am going to um, skip uh, the questions. Uh, Farrakhan, I'm going to come back to you uh, because I know you you would have maybe two questions, but I'm going to ask three questions, Sayed. So if you, um, this has come through the chat. So it says, Asalaamu Alaikum, I have three questions um, one by one. Uh, my first question is about Zabih Azim verse in the story of the Prophet Ismail. Uh, I've heard that the Zabih Azim is referred to Imam Hussein Is this authentic? If not, how can we explain an animal being considered as a greater sacrifice than a Prophet? Uh, uh, as that is the argument usually put forward in support of the verse being about Imam Hussein. Question number one. 
Can I ask the second and the third as well? Okay. Um, yeah, sure. Okay. My second question is about the following passage that I read in an English translation of the Maktal that Sayyid is reading from. Uh, the people pounced on Ali, Hazrat Ali, Ali, Ali Akbar and cut him with their swords. He called out, my father, my last salutations of peace to you. I see my grandfather, messenger of God, sending you greetings of peace and saying, hurry, come to us. Then he looked. He took a deep breath and his soul parted his body and left this world. Does this mean that souls can return to this world when uh, Allah allows it? I think this has been answered in one of our previous quest, um, sessions that you can just touch on that. And the final question from um, the sister is my third question is that when Imam Hussein left for Kufa, I read uh, in the maktal that many many people advised him against it but the imam said that it is allah's will if karbala was part of allah's plan for the ummah isn't it unfair on the enemy in a way that they were meant to kill imam hussein okay um yeah Right. So these are great questions, mashallah. Uh, question number one with regard to Dibhin Azim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ransomed Ismail alayhi salam for a great sacrifice. Uh, the argument is how can an animal be greater than a prophet? So first of all, when Allah says, We ransomed him for a great sacrifice. There is nothing in the verse that's claiming that the sacrifice is greater than the prophet who was about to be sacrificed, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is simply saying that Prophet Ismail alayhi salam was going to be sacrificed by Ibrahim alayhi salam. He was going to be slaughtered. We removed Ismail alayhi salam and in his place, we, re we replaced it with a great sacrifice. But he doesn't say that that sacrifice was greater than Ismail alayhi salam. So that you should ask, how can an animal be greater than the Prophet? The Quran is not claiming the animal was greater than the Prophet. And also you can add to it that that sacrificial lamb that was placed in place of Ismail alayhi salam is not the only ransom. Rather, you can see until the day of judgment, Allah later on says, We left a great mention for him in the days to come. So until the day of judgment, from the time of the Prophet wasallam, in fact, even before that, until the Day of Judgment, everyone who will go for Hajj and who will perform Hajj al-Tamattu will sacrifice. When you sacrifice the animal, that is in memory of what? It is in memory of the sacrifice of Ismail salam. So all those animals are, being, are serving as a ransom for Ismail salam, And that is a great ransom that for one uh, Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his place has uh, mandated and legislated that so many thousands and millions of animals are to be sacrificed. But there is nothing in the verse of the Quran to indicate that these sacrifices are greater than Prophet Ismail alayhi salam. So that's with regard to Ribhan Azim. To say that this refers to Imam Hussain alayhi salam, well, if uh, this is this is problematic, even though it has been argued, there are certain exegetes who have tried to say that, well, you could say that Imam Hussain alayhi uh, salam has been, but then that would that would uh, make Imam Hussain alayhi salam from the traditional 12-hour point of view, they would obviously like this interpretation, but then it brings Imam Hussain down, which uh, uh, it keeps him below Ismail alayhi salam, because when you ransom someone for someone, uh, you usually ransom the thing that is less precious, for the thing that is more precious. So if you're going to say that um, Imam Hussain alayhi salam is the ransom for Prophet Ismail alayhi salam, then from a Sunni, from a non-Shi'i or non-12-hour Imami perspective, that shouldn't be such a problem. But from a traditional 12-hour Imami perspective, which regards Imam Hussain alayhi salam as being higher than prophets, then that would be problematic for them. So this is something that they would not be too pleased with. With regard to number two, question number two, Hazrat Ali Akbar's last moments, so the maktab, I think that you're reading in English, is probably the fake one. Yeah, the, the pseudo Abu Mikhna, where this is mentioned. But if you look at the original maktal that has been reconstructed, and I actually did present it in the series, uh, there is no mention of this last moment where he sees, where he says that I can see my grandfather and this and that. 
Although if there was mention of this in the original maktal, uh, we do know from the Quran that in the last moments of a person's life, a person can see things on the other side. So uh, this is not entirely implausible. Uh, but yeah, it's just that it's not, the transmission is not very strong. So we can't really definitively base anything on it. Okay. These are reports. These are embellishments. These are additions, uh, which may be plausible, may not be plausible. Ultimately, we cannot base anything definitive on it. Question number three. Imam Hussain a.s. was warned by many people not to go to Kufa. He ignored their warnings. He actually didn't ignore it. He conceded. He accepted their advice. He just didn't act on it. But he did not challenge their advice and say that you're you're giving me wrong advice. Or He understood that politically and from a worldly point of view, what the people were saying was true. He uh, Under the given un, uh, under the uh, circumstances he was in, it was very risky to go to Kufa. And the people of Kufa were known for treachery and betrayal. But Imam Hussain Salam's thinking was that they have sent me letters. They have invited me. And so I am under obligation now because on the day of judgment, they can have a hujja against me and say that, look, we invited you at the last moment you turned back. So it's not our fault. You know, we were ready to support you in establishing the Quran and Sunnah. Then Imam Hussain alayhi salam would un be under scrutiny from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when you had so many supporters actively calling you and inviting you to Kufa, then why didn't you go to establish my book and the Sunnah of my messenger? So Imam Hussain alayhi salam decided to complete the hujja against the people of Kufa until the very end. And that's why he did not turn back. Imam Hussain alayhi salam. Uh, so the question then is that if the whole event of Karbala was ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then isn't that unfair on the enemy? As in now you're bringing in the predestination concept that everything was predestined by Allah uh, as if, as if, well, Ayyadu Billah, Yazid and Ibn Ziyad and all these people were like, actors on the stage who were hired by Allah to to uh, perform everything, you know, the role that they perform. That is not the case. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has predestined and decreed certain things. But his decree, and this is one of the greatest mysteries that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt say, this is one of the greatest secrets and mysteries of Allah, that how he's able to decree everything in advance and have knowledge of everything in advance without affecting our free will. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what we are going to do before we do it. But his knowledge of the fact that we are going to do something does not influence our free will. Because if it were to influence our free will, God's test would stand cancelled. It would be invalidated. It would be unjust. So yes, this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are so many mysteries and secrets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the human mind simply cannot fathom and decipher. I mean, our human mind is so weak uh, that in spite of all our progress and all our advances in technology, we still don't even know what's beyond the observable universe. Like what's out there beyond the uh, horizon, we don't know. So how can we read the mind of God and understand how God functions and how God is able to do things uh, we can only know what he tells us in his revelation. And uh, in his revelation, he has made it very clear that he has given us the free will and that nothing affects that free will that he has given us. It's sacrosanct. It's sacred. He doesn't mess with it. And uh, it's it's because of this free will that he's uh, he actually turns down the eyes of his own prophets. Like when Ibrahim alayhi salam prays to Allah after receiving uh, Allah tells him, Inni nasi imama. I'm making you into this leader, role model for all people to come. He says, Wa min Please give it to my offspring as well. And Allah says, no, I can't give it to your offspring. Not to all of them. Why not? So, qala la yanalu ahdil because there will be some zalimin. There, there will be some wrongdoers and oppressors. I can't give my covenant to oppressors. So, ya Allah, can't you ensure that all the progeny of Ibrahim turn out to be good people? No, Allah cannot ensure that. Why? Yani, as in he has power over everything, but it goes against his policy. To ensure only good people within the progeny of Ibrahim, Allah would have to take away the free will of the progeny of Ibrahim. And he does not want to take away that. And because he does not take away that, there will always be the possibility that some from the progeny of Ibrahim will go south, others will remain on the straight path. Some will deviate, some will remain, as Allah himself says, وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِهِمَا مُحْسِنٌ وَظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ مُبِينٌ 
from the progeny of Ibrahim and Ishaq, they were righteous people and they were also manifest oppressors and wrongdoers. So yeah, it is not unfair on the army of Yazid because Allah gave them full free will. He did not force them. They were not uh, these actors on the stage who are being uh, micromanaged and directed by Allah. Well, billah, that was the ar logic of Banu Umayyah, that Allah killed Imam Hussein. Billah. No, they were given the free will. Imam Hussein gave them the option that let me go. They didn't take that option. And so they will have to suffer the consequences on the day of judgment. That just answers how Hur actually flips because he is the one who actually is, um, well, I guess, you know, uh, guided uh, and chooses his free will. And his free will is to leave the dunya and uh, and fight for that. I think Hobbuk dunya is, is, is really, really, you know, it's messy because uh, we do a lot of things for the for for the for the goodness of this of this world you know even uh, somebody was reciting day before yesterday and said oh you know whenever it comes to the three uh, scenes of pandar Shaban, you know we are there we want long life we want money you know like uh, but <laughs> When it comes to Yasin on any other day, you know, we've got outstanding Muslims who standing outside the mosque. But khair. Um, all right, so we have uh, two hands raised up. We have some questions that are not about uh, Mahanam. I will leave um, this one to Muhammad Oda, and then there's one more question I need to ask. Muhammad, you can ask your question. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Assalamu alaikum dear Sheikh. Wa Now that you've alhamdulillah cleared up the authentic and tahar teachings of Ahlul Bayt from the Ghulu regarding the mart martyrdom of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, we've come to understand that Al Hussein was all about reviving the profound teachings of Al Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Alhamdulillah, I, I feel like we have through this series and, and, and the Islah channel as a whole got a good understanding of the pure aqidah of our beloved imams and even though this channel has a dozen videos regarding the practical sunnah of rasulullah for example timing of maghrib and and reciting partial surahs there are still many things i feel unsure about such as khumus and congregational prayers with other faith groups so my question is do you have a marja or a source that we could refer to so that we could real so that we could learn the real teachings of Rasulullah and Ahl al-Bayt? Yes, um, there are actually plenty of resources that are available in the English, uh, sorry, in the Arabic language. Um, there are these researches that are taking place uh, within the Hawzat. One of the biggest problems that happened within the Shia sect, unfortunately, was that under the influence of sectarianism, many of the actual fatwa and position of Imams of Ahl al-Bayt were abandoned and rejected because they agreed with the practice of the mainstream. Even though the Sanad and the narration is authentic, they will reject it because it agrees with the practice of the mainstream. And this is this is one of the innovations of the Gulat. The Gulat wanted to create a separate identity, a separate practice, everything separate for... For example, the, the third Shahada in Adhan? Yes, that's one example. The, uh, the, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, we know from the sources, from Man La Yahdurul Faqih, from... The four books, we know that the Imams never said this, but the Gulat, they added it. Why? They wanted to make our Adhan separate from that of the rest of the Muslims. So wherever possible, see, there were some areas where the Ahlul Bayt actually had differences with the rest of the Muslims. So those are documented in both Shia and Sunni sources. But then there are many areas where artificially differences were created to, to widen the gulf. So inshallah, one of the projects that we have at Al-Islah through the big fit series, for example, and other lectures we are going to do, we're going to clarify, uh, inshallah, to the best of our ability, what the actual position of Ahlul Bayt Ali Muslim was. Usually you will notice that the position of Ahlul Bayt always agrees with the Quran. And the Ahlul Bayt themselves told us, anything we say, if it does not fit in with the worldview of the Quran, throw it. It is not our hadith. Rather, it is a lie upon us from the Hulat. So that's why, inshallah, this is a great project. There's a lot of research going in the Hawzat, al almiya in Qom, in Najaf, in Lebanon. And inshallah, we'll try our best to present you with the best researches that are coming from the scholarship. 
that talk about areas where we need to reform and realign our position with that of the Ahlul Bayt Ali Muslim. Inshallah. Barakallah. And thank you very much for your very kind words. Jazakallah, Shaykh Nafs. Barakallah, Shaykh Nafs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Farkin, uh, you can unmute and ask your question. I'll ask my question last. Assalamu uh, alaikum, Sayyid. Um, so I'll be very, very quick. I know we're, we've got a lot to, I won't, I'll keep it short. Uh, just looking at the methodology of research, um, from my uh, background, what I've always done is I've taken stuff from Sunni sources and Shia sources, like, and I've done a Venn diagram. And when they've overlapped, for me, that's been certainty. Um, do you think that's a good method to apply? Because there's so much confusion. And Alhamdulillah, you're clarifying a lot of it at the moment. And we're immensely grateful for that. And, and one very quick question, because you touched on verse 55 on Walaya, um, about the verse where that um, Allah says, I am your wali, the Prophet is the wali, and those who um, give zakat in sajood. Uh, I've always referred that to Imam Ali al-Islam. But is that because it was supported by hadith? And is that hadith an authentic hadith? And also the rule is that even if it's a single chain of narration, if it's supporting, if it's in the fazail of the Ahl al-Bayt al-Islam and doesn't contradict a verse of the Quran, you should accept it. And that's what I've always learned from my elders. Thank you very much, Sayyid. Again, I thank you so much for all your lectures. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you very much for your for your questions. Um, I love your Venn diagram uh, idea. That's a very good safety mechanism. But I need to warn you that that is not always foolproof. And so that's why one thing that I would say to add to your Venn diagram, which I'm sure you already have, but just as a reminder, is to start with the Quran. Okay. So some, let me give you an actual example <laughs> where you will see that your, your Venn diagram test might fail but you will still pass if you hold on to the Quran. So, for example, but, but these are generally speaking, not things that affect you on a day to day basis. For example, punishment of adultery. You will notice that Shia, uh, Shia narrations, uh, Sunni narrations, <laughs> Zaidi narrations, they all converge in the Venn diagram. It will show that they are all supporting stoning. But when you come to the Quran, you will see verses, for example, the opening verses of Surah An-Nur, where Allah prescribes lashes and not stoning. Similarly, in Surah An-Nisa, he actually explicitly says that if a slave girl commits adultery, then her punishment, Surah 4, verse 24 and 25, Allah says, if after slave girls get married, if they commit adultery, then they shall receive half the punishment that a free woman would get if she were to commit adultery. Now, if the punishment of the adult free man and free woman is stoning, as is the case in the Sunni, Shia, Zaidi transmissions, then how do you have stoning? How do you divide stoning into half? You can't. So here, the Quranic evidence is going against the narratives, uh, the, the joint narrative of the Shia, Sunni and Zaidi. So there are some areas where sectarian transmissions do not gel well with the Quran. So that's why I would say that the best safety mechanism is to start with the Quran, make the Quran your biggest guiding light. And then after the Quran, and so long as there is no contradiction with the Quran, then if you have a Venn diagram where Shia, Sunni, Zaidi, Ibadi, everyone is agreeing, then yes, that is certainty and you are on very safe ground. Number one. Number two, with regard to verse, Surah 5, verse 55. Yes, you are right that if there is a single chain narration, it is authentic in its sanad, it does not contradict with the Quran, and it's in the fadaila of Ahlul Bayt, then we obviously accept it. But here, if you look at Surah, verse, uh, surah 5, verse 55, in its context, in the passage in which Allah has placed it, you can see that the whole passage is talking about something very specific, which is and it's talking about a very real problem that was affecting people in Medina. Is that there were these Muslims in Medina who feared invasion. Medina was under threat during the time of the Prophet. Every time people, sometimes people used to wake up in the middle of the night scared. Oh, what if there is an invasion? 
So they were living under these circumstances and they were trying to find alliances in the Arab tribal society. You know, this is how the world works even today. What is NATO? NATO and all these non-aligned nations and Russia is trying to build its block. Alliances are a very human phenomenon. And so in Medina, whenever you are under threat, you will always try to search for alliances. And so there's this group of Muslims in Medina who know that Medina can be attacked anytime and their Iman is weak. So they are not confident that the prophet and the believers would always succeed in every battle. They have seen that sometimes like in the battle of Uhud, you know, victory was converted into defeat. So they are like, you know, we need to think about our safety. If we only remain on the side of the prophet, then we are at a risk. So why not forge alliances with other strong parties so that in times of need, they can come to our help. And if you read the passage, Surah, verse, Surah 5, verse 50, all the way up to 56, you will see that this is what Allah is talking about. This Allah says, فَتَرَ الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ O Prophet, you are going to see that those people who have disease in their hearts, يُسَارِعُونَ فِيهِمْ They are rushing to forge alliances with anti-Islam, hostile Jewish and Christian groups. And Allah says, when you confront them, they will say, يَقُولُونَ نَخْشَى أَن تُصِيبَنَا دَائِرَةً They say, no, we fear, uh, we fear that a calamity may befall us. Yani, suppose Medina is invaded, then who will protect us? So Allah says, yes, this is the problem with these people. They have disease in their hearts. They don't have strong iman. If you have strong iman, and Allah is inviting us to strong iman in this verse, He's saying, look, إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا You should align yourself with Allah, the Messenger, and those who believe, and 100% Imam Ali alayhi salam is one of those who believe. We cannot exclude him from this. But to argue that those who believe, this phrase, those who believe, refers to only one person, and the entire community of believers in Medina is excluded, this does not fit in with the context of the verse. So this is why we give up that interpretation, and we accept the interpretation that is more in line with the context, and with the overall message and vision of this passage. Excellent. All right. No. Just learning new things. It's amazing. Um, right. Is your question connected to the one that you asked before? Okay. Um, no, sir, it's a new question. It's a new, new question. New. Yeah, is one, it question, connect, one Is it connected to Maharam? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Very quickly, please. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Sayyidna, my question is that um, uh, you explained in the Maktal how uh, Imam al -Islam strategized. But to me, uh, the problem is that how come thirsty and people who are not actually prepared for war, who do not have uh, specific uh, weapons ready for war, in two or three days in a plane where you have an army absolutely in front of you and you are in front of them. So there is no hindrance. So how deep that trench was and like in a day or two, how much did they prepare that they, in a way... Uh, repulsed uh, the army of Yazid so much that they were compelled to fight them one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, why wouldn't such a huge army would just shoot arrows and finish it off or just one gallop of horses and spears and everything gone? So w w why not that? I mean, how to, how, how, how to explain this thing? Can you please hear? Yeah. Right. So Imam Hussein alayhi salam, obviously was proceeding to Kufa to establish the caliphate over there. And uh, because this is what he was invited to Kufa for. So he was going with an entourage and people in those days, uh, they used to, when they used to travel, they used to keep arms. Yani they used to be well armed because you could be attacked by bandits. You could be attacked by anyone on the road. They used to be highway robbers. Uh, so yes, People, Imam Hussein Ali Salam was well armed, and uh, so were the Banu Hashim who were accompanying him. His Ashab were also well armed in the sense, yani, 
They had swords, they had spears, they had the basic weaponry. That's number one. Number two, with regard to the trench, the trench that was dug, dug around the tents was not a very big or massive uh, trench, like the one that the Prophet ﷺ had dug around Medina. That was a really large trench. This trench <clears throat> was not a very large trench. And this is why Imam Hussain had to fill it with firewood and set the firewood on fire in order to prevent the enemy. So the enemies were not, uh, the reason why they couldn't attack Imam Hussein's tents from behind was not because they were not able to jump over the tent, the, the trench. If it was just a trench, they would just jump over it. But because there was fire, so there's, whenever you see a, even a small trench and there is fire burning all over, then obviously how do you pass through it, right? So this is what Imam Hussain Ali Salam's strategy was, is that he did not want to be attacked from all sides, at least uh, as much as, uh, as he could uh, afford. So that's why he surrounded the tents with this trench. He put firewood in them. And this is what forced the army of Yazid to attack him only in Wajhin Wahid, as the Riwaya in the Maqtal says. Now, what, the army of Yazid had a lot of soldiers, thousands of them. So why did they not just finish them off in one gallop? Well, this was not their idea. See, they, they were, first of all, when they reached Karbala, there were negotiations. There was talks. They did not just come and start shooting arrows. They first wanted to, they were instructed by Ibn Ziyad that first you have negotiations, try to get him to surrender. So that, and, and every army, their, their best option, an ideal option for them is that your enemy should surrender without any fight so that you don't get killed and hurt. So they had to first try for that. And after the talks failed, then also the army of Yazid did not fight all together at the same time. Rather, in the beginning, you see there were single combats and then two, two, three, four, four people were going and fighting. And also the army of Yazid felt ashamed that when two, three people are just coming to fight, then we send an army of a thousand that makes us look weak. So they were also forced to meet the army of Imam Hussein in these single combat. And uh, this is where the Imam Hussein's army really uh, wreaked havoc. And uh, this is where the army of Imam Hussein Alayhi really got the better of their side. And this is why later on you notice that they abandoned this policy and they started attacking in greater groups. Um, uh, but yeah, generally speaking, and, and also the issue was that the army of Yazid, you know, they had that tribal mindset, even when it came to killing Imam Hussein Alayhi Salam, you can see that there was a lot of hesitation. Um, people were not willing to go and finish him off. Why? Because of the fear that if he is the chief of the Banu Hashim and the Banu Abdul Muttalib, and so the Arabs have this concept of vendetta, if, if they, the Arabs do not forget blood. So there was this worldly fear that the Banu Hashim are going to come after us. Whosoever will kill him, the, he will become a bullseye for the Banu Hashim whenever they get the opportunity. And also there was recognition that he is the grandson of the Prophet. So even in the hereafter, I mean, if we can avoid it, why do it? So this is why you will see actually in the Riwayah of the Maqtal, Shimr has to urge the people and say, what are you waiting for? You know, get the job done. And Umar ibn Sa'd also is frustrated by seeing. So yes, the, the, the army of Yazid had a lot of issues affecting it because of which things uh, did not uh, they, they did not proceed as quickly as uh, people would have uh, would imagine. Rather, things went quite slowly. And uh, yeah, until they reached the final conclusion. <clears throat> you know, I just thought of something. It says, jump over the fire of the trench right, uh, was another test for me. It would have been another test to say, I'm carrying my hell with me because that fire of the earth is not going to be as hot as the fire of hell. Yeah, so um, let me get Shuja to ask his question. It's not related to Maharam, but he's requested me. So I will let him ask his question and then I will ask my last question. I'm really sorry for your time. Assalamu alaikum Sayyidina. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. How are you? Is everything good? Alhamdulillah. How about yourself? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. With your du'as, everything's been good. Um, my question is, 
uh, here my camera was. My question is a, a two-part question. One is regarding the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi min shaitan wa rajim, bismillahirrahmanirrahim, al kitab la rayba fiyah. Now, the translators have translated dhalika as this instead of that. So my question is, is there a specific reason for this? Or if you could shed some light. And then my second part question is regarding the verse on wudu in Surah Al-Ma'idah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, now, according to what we were taught in uh, when in Sunday Madrasa, we were told to like wash downwards like this, always going downwards. However, I'm seeing in this verse Allah is saying like till your elbow. So that's making me think maybe upwards. So if you could shed some light on that, I'd really appreciate it. Jazakumallah. Uh, these are very good questions uh, that Brother Shuja has asked. Um, the Your first question was about uh, Thalik al-Kitab. So Thalika in Arabic, generally speaking, literally, if you go by the rules of linguistics and grammar, Thalika is ismul isharati lil ba'id. Thalika mm. is ismul isharati lil ba'id, meaning it's a demonstrative pronoun for something that's far away. Okay, so if a if I have a book, okay, which is very near to me, I'm not going to say Dalik al Kitab. I'm going to say Had al Kitab. This, yeah, yes. But if I place this very far away, then I'm going to say Dalik al Kitab, that book. Right. Now, why does Allah refer to the Quran as Dalika? Uh, the scholars of Balagha and grammar will say that it, that is because even though the Quran is very close to Allah, uh, and it is emanating from him. But Allah wants to show you the importance of this book and the fact that he is placing the book on a very high pedestal in relation to us. So because he's pointing to the book for us, for us, the Quran is on a very high pedestal. And so therefore, Allah is using the distant demonstrative pronoun to show you that the Quran is very, it's on a place that's very far above. It's coming from a place that's very far above you. And indeed, the Quran is preserved in the Lawhi Mahfuz, in the master book, the mother of all books. And so in Surah Zukhruf also Allah says, وَإِنَّهُ لَفِي أُمِّ الْكِتَابِ لَدَيْنَا لَعَلِيٌّ حَكِيمٌ That this Quran, in the mother of all books that we have, Allah has a master book that has everything, every knowledge of the universe is in that master record and that master book. So Allah says, this Quran in that master book has a very high position and it's recognized in that register as a book of wisdom. So Dhalika is simply being used here to demonstrate the elevation of the Quran and its sublime uh, elevation and highness in relation to us. But the translators will translate it as this is the book, which is also not a problematic translation because they are looking at it from the point of view that for Allah, the Quran because it is emanating from him, for him it is very near. So for him, when he says Zalika, it doesn't really mean that, it means this. Okay. okay. It's not a very significant difference. Uh, that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use both demonstrative pronouns. Ismul Isharatil Ba'id and Ismul Isharatil Qareeb. Because he doesn't only use Zalika. In Surah Al-An'am, he will say, Wahada kitabun anzalnahu mubarakun. Wahada right. kitabun. And this is a book. So he uses that, he uses this. Both uh, these uh, formulations are designed to show you different aspects of the Quran. One formulation shows you the Quran on a very high pedestal. The other shows you the Quran as being something that's very close to Allah and emanating from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. So, right. so this is the, the first question. The second question is with regard to the washing of the arms, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, فَغْسِلُوا أَيْدِيَكُمْ فَغْسِلُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ وَأَيْدِيَكُمْ إِلَى الْمَرَافِقِ So yes, the verse of the Quran says until the ankles. No, sorry, until the, the, the ankles. Right. Uh, the question you have asked is whether it means I should wash uh, yani downwards or whether I should wash upwards. Right. So what we would say is that this is, as you will know, this is a difference uh, between Shia and Sunni uh, practice. The Sunnis will generally wash uh, down, uh, yani they will take the water uh, downwards towards the ankles, right. right? Whereas the Shia will wash it uh, fr from, from the from elbows. Down. 
Right. As far as the language and the grammar and the linguistics of the Quran is concerned, both is fine. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he tells you, for example, for this pen, he tells you that this pen has to be washed until this point. To be honest, it doesn't really matter whether you start washing from here to here or you wash from here to here. The important thing is that this entire area is to be washed. Okay. Okay. Right. Makes sense. So right. whether you wash it, whether you start from here or whether you start from here is not something that you will be questioned about. What you will be questioned about is whether you washed the, the area that was set by Allah. So Allah gave you a limit from your hand until the elbow. So this area, okay. you have to make sure you wash it. Direction, right. different Muslims will follow different uh, methods, you know, it's, but it's one and the same thing. It's like, you know, in, the, in North America, you will turn on the lights uh, maybe this way. In the UK, okay. you will turn on this yeah. way. Doesn't really make that much. It's difference. like the little nitty gritty things we argue about. <laughs> yes, yes, and we shouldn't really be arguing about these. Rather, yeah. these are differences that can be tolerated and uh, celebrated. In fact, correct. Jazakumullah. Thank you for your answer. Appreciate it. Thank you, Shuja, for your question. All right, uh, <clears throat> my question on celebration. So, Surah Fajr. Ya uh, nafsin Right. What I hear from the member is that when Imam Hussein is fighting, there comes a time where he hears this particular ayat and he takes his sword and puts it back into the scabbard and stops, right? So this is my question. If the Lord is inviting back Imam Hussein with total acceptance for what he has done, why are we crying for him? when he is in the best and the greatest favors of his word. Right. So this is a deep question that you've asked and one that we've been discussing uh, and, and deliberating over this entire series. And so, yes, there is no doubt that as far as uh, the promise of the Quran is concerned, as far as the teaching of Islam is concerned, all shuhada, not just Imam Hussain al Islam, but all those who are killed, in the path of Allah, Allah shows us in the Quran that once they go back to Allah, yes, Allah. They are in a state of joy and celebration. They are happy with what Allah has given them. bima Allahu min fadlik. As Allah says in Surah Ali Imran, they are extremely happy and joyous and jubilant due to the bounty and grace that Allah has conferred upon them. So yes. Uh, the issue is, as far as our sadness and our tears are concerned, it is not because we believe that they are uh, that the pain is continuing. We know that the pain and the suffering is over. Now the reward has begun. Our feeling of griefness, our our feeling of sadness, sorry, and grief is only at that particular historical moment in history. It's a moment that is caught and trapped in history, the moment when all these uh, acts of oppression and uh, inhumane, barbaric zulm happen against Ahlul Bayt, the heart feels sad for that. The eyes even shed tears whenever we mention or whenever we read the accounts of that. But given the fact that Imam Hussain Alayhi Salam now is in, in the shadow of Allah's mercy and His grace, yes, it doesn't make sense to... Uh, to make this the dominating and defining feature of our approach to the remembrance of Imam Hussein Ali Salam. Rather, the dominating feature of our approach to remembering Imam Hussein Ali Salam should be conversations and serious discussions about how we can revive the Quran and Sunnah in our lives. In this modern age, there are so many challenges, there are so many attacks on Islam, so many objections, so many modernist liberal ideas emerging gender relationships are being re-identified redefined so many of these attacks on islam and islamic values islamic principles islamic morality reviving the quran and sunnah today what can we do about it this is what i feel our muharram discussions should be all about thank you very much for that um inshallah we i hope me personally um that i understand the concept of 
the tragedy of Karbala. Um, yes, I am sad that, you know, it, it was barbaric what they did to him. Um, the grandson of the Prophet, the, the son of Bibi Fatima Imam Ali, of course it, it hurts deep inside that these people were evil, these people did not have hearts, these people had uh, had hope of dunya in their hearts so much so that they did not care about what they were doing. And I pray that wherever or however God wants to elevate our statuses, that he keeps us humble and that he he removes ego in us and that you know we are straight 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 muslims inshallah um thank you for your time for your for your um vast knowledge uh, in in being able to answer all these questions i know people have been writing on our chat and saying you know they've really appreciated um the sessions they've uh, they've benefited not only themselves personally, but the family has benefited immensely. So, and they hope to see more of such series. So inshallah, with your permission, with your time, uh, we will be here again. Uh, don't forget to uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. There's always something that's coming up. And Sayyid, um, I mean, only there, the jaza of this is with him. I cannot say anything. I'm also very grateful to you for being such a patient and gracious uh, moderator and for facilitating these discussions and these questions. I want to apologize for the long-winded answers, but in my defense, uh, our audience uh, is so learned, mashallah, they ask such loaded questions that you just cannot do justice to them in very small sound bites. So I want to apologize still for, for taking so much uh, time and for being long-winded. Uh, but I'm also very grateful to you for your patience and for your graciousness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and may he reward you and reward all our attendees. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us and give us the tawfiq to take the best of the knowledge that we that has been disseminated in this series and implemented in our lives and basically become the best followers of the Prophet and his family that we possibly can be, inshallah. Thank you so much.